hey, today um, I want to talk to you about uh, an adventure that I had and a time that I had a chance to go to. I went down to Ecuador um, because I was, um, there was an eco lodge down there that was interested in having me teach um, some bird drawing, nature journaling workshops out of their site. And um, I went down there to just do some uh, recon and ended up doing not just that, but a ton of nature journaling. It was nuts. It was really nuts. I've, I've grown up in, in, in California, which I've always thought of. It's like, it's this wonderful, very, very biodiverse place. Um, and um, then realized that I have, have been spending, you know, most of my adult life living in a sort of medium biodiverse place. This was off the hook in terms of abundance, abundance, beauty of the critters, diversity of the critters, and the cooperativeness of the critters. I'm used to, you know, like, you know, birds, uh, they don't want to have anything to do with you. And so they're going to, they're going to fly away and hide. And um, here, the birds are like, they're used to the, the folks setting out bananas for them, and they'll come out and kind of hang out with you eating a banana. And it's crazy. So I'm going to show you some of this, the sketches that I did. And in the course of doing that, I um, refined and further developed some of my drawing birds. Um, and so, uh, hold on, I'm getting a little notice on my machine here about my audio. Um, Avea, can I be heard clearly? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, the, uh, so I developed and refined some tricks on drawing birds. I'm going to share those with you today um, because what my general approach was, and I'll be kind of demonstrating that in a moment, is that I didn't want to have my nose in the book the whole time. I wanted to be looking at the birds. And so I would take a bunch of notes and then fill those out and then try to figure out who the bird was later. So there's there are a number of mistakes that kind of came into my sketches because I was doing that. Sometimes when you're looking up at the bird, you'll, you'll put that wing bar down or something in the wrong place. That's okay. That's okay. Um, but the, um, uh, but it, it, it helped me, I, I, I'm now able to kind of get a lot more bird information down when the bird is being up there in front of me and, and cooperative. Oh, and one last thing about this whole Costa Rica thing. So it was cool. We're going back. And um, um, Avea, can I bring you on? All right, so I'm gonna add you in on the spotlight. So what's gonna happen is the two of us are gonna lead a coast, a non coast Rica trip in Ecuador, nature journaling adventure together. Um, and we're, we'd love, um, wanna invite you folks to come on down there with us, um, or depending on where you are up there, or depending on how you think of the globe, that could be up, down, or over. Um, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. And um, the, uh, and, and, and so is, is, is going to be great. It's going to be great. Right. <laughs> so we're looking forward to doing that. So here's, here's, so let me show you the preview right now. Um, think. let's jump over to the document camera here and just with a, um, a little bit of a walk through, um, the sketches that I did there. Um, and so it started off um, here. So just a little bit of a journal flip. Um, this was uh, while I was in uh, on the flight over and in the airport, I did this little map of, of Ecuador. And why is it called Ecuador? Because it's on the equator. So Ecuador comes from equator. And this little bird, I didn't see this species, but when I was in the airport doing a little drawing demo for Amelia and Carolyn, um, we, we drew this bird and we talked about kind of putting notes in. So then um, I arrived, we land in Quito and we drove to a spot called Tandeapa, which is um, near there. Um, and the, uh, walked out onto the back porch and there's this smorgasbord of crazy hummingbird activity. So I'm used to um, 
I'm used to one hummingbird on the feeder and it's an Anna's hummingbird. So here, there were four feeders. There were probably simultaneously 20 hummingbirds working those feeders of, and a whole bunch of different species. And, you know, ones with, 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 with red bills and, and, and all these different sort of spots. And so what I started doing is I would start a drawing of a hummingbird and then the hummingbird would go away and then I would start another one and then start another one. So I'd have, and as a species that I'd seen before would come back, I would jump back to that drawing and so like it didn't do this drawing and then do this drawing. All these drawings were simultaneously happening at the same time, but it just depends on who was cooperative to me um, at, at one point or another. And something that was really fun about that is that you, know, you could only keep a little bit, I, I do not have a photographic memory. Oh, by the way, neither do you and neither do most people. Um, the so the photographic memory is a bit of a myth um some people do have a uh, some small children will have something kind of close to what we think of as a photographic memory for a short period in their development and interestingly enough those kids who do it's actually a bad sign um, because there are, it's often a sign of significant developmental issues and developmental delays. Um, but so instead of a photographic memory, which we're glad we don't have, um, what we what we do, well, I'm going to change my microphone so that, oh yeah, I'm good. Um, so what we want to do is you can just keep a little bit in your head for a, a bit of time. So what I could do is I could keep about this much information. Um, you know, a blue head, green, and then it had a white throat. And so I would make a little sketch and I would put, um, I would, you know, could kind of get some of that down with my little um, purple pencil here. And, but I couldn't get, you know, head to toe. So I'm not looking at the thing and then transcribing it. I would get a little bit of information, then a little bit of information, then a little bit of information. And I'm bouncing around from all these different birds as that's going on. So it is kind of like, you know, attention deficit disorder sketching, um, where I'm like ping pong balling all around, but you know, that's what the birds give me. So you'll see throughout these, there's lots of places where like there's a little P here. So that's a little um, purple note. Um, and that this one has a little purple spot on its throat. And, oh, that's right. This page was done upside down. You know, I, if you're going to the, um, I, I, I went to the, uh, eventually down to the Southern Hemisphere. So that means that the channel has to be upside down, right? Or maybe I just held my book the wrong way when I was doing that page. Um, so then this, this crazy beastie shows up. Look at this, right? That, I mean, that's ridiculous. That's nuts. Um, let me kind of get the level of focus. There we go. Um, so um, long, long, long tails with iridescent colors on them. Um, and um, this one is really fun. It has these thin fibers of of, of uh, these two long tail feathers, but this bird, hummingbird trims these feathers so that you just get a long stalk with a little flag at the end of it. So this used to be a long feather, but the bird has trimmed all this stuff out. And this one also has this big patch, this big fuzzy white patch, which my daughters described as Ugg boots. So these were the ones which we called Uggs. Um, so these little hummingbirds with Ugg boots. But you know, right over here, you can see the way that a lot of these sketches start. A lot of these sketches start. So there's a light, um, there's a light um, pencil sketch, and I'm having little color notes with lines pointing to different um, different parts. So this is saying dark down in here. This is saying green in here, and um, then that becomes the framework that I, I, I sketch the bird over. Um, in addition to hummingbirds, there was a diversity of frugivorous birds. Um, so these are ones that they eat fruit. 
And so if you um, take a log and put bananas on it, all these birds will fly down to it and they are just spectacular. Like, so here's the toucan barbet. Um, notice that, I'm gonna zoom in on this picture here. Notice that it says green right in there. See that? It says green. Um, it used to say gray there. There's a little R pointing to the I. Um, it says um, uh, gray right here across the, the, the wing. So there are little color notes also that are happening as I'm seeing these birds because um, if I just have my pen in my hand, by the time I get to my brush, I'm going to have forgotten what I, what I saw. And then this is really fun. This is a slug. This is a slug. There's this brown leaf-like slug. This is life size. Here it is in cross section, very flattened, dorsoventry flattened slug with little strange bumps in the texture around its skin. Here's the ventral side. This one had been stepped on by somebody. Um, and so it was um, paralyzed. It couldn't move and was, was unfortunately dying. Um, but it, um, the, the, some parts of it were, were still alive. It could still kind of move this part of its foot, but it couldn't, it couldn't crawl because this part had been gooshed by somebody. So be nice to slugs, everybody out there. Um, you see that for a lot of these, um, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, even identifying them. Some of them, they get a name and which I, I would put in later, but on a lot of these, I'm, I'm not even worried about that. Um, they, this is cool. Look at that. That's life size. This is a flatworm that was crawling through the forest. It is so cool. It was so, it has these white racing stripes, this black body, this kind of very flattened thing. They are predators on slugs and snails. And um, I thought that was just super cool. Um, the, uh, here's some little sketches of prop roots on trees. So there's just so much to do. Um, at the spot where I was staying, they had this little hut called a blind. Here's the little hut. Um, and um, the, it had screening over it. So birds, if you're inside that, the birds couldn't see you. And then they put a big pile of fruit out here on the ground. And also they put a, uh, have a little frame that holds a sheet on it and they have a black light on that at night. So at night, this gets covered with moths. And then you get out here early in the morning and you see all the insectivorous birds that come to this sheet to pick the moths off it. And these two birds here are two of the ones that I um, that I that I saw there, and um, and that was that was that was really cool. Um, back to hummingbirds because we can, and look at these things. This is this is this is a tanager here. Um, tanagers here in the, in the United States, we've got just a few species of them, but Ecuador was filled with all these different kinds of tan tanagers. And what the tanagers do is they will hang out in these mixed flocks of birds, mixed flocks of fruit eaters. So they would ha hang out with this one and all these ones together. And they are hanging out together and they go through the forest from site to site to site to site to site. And so they're all looking out for predators together. They've got slightly different bill adaptations, so slightly different sort of feeding strategies. So there's a little bit less competition between them. So it's better than going out in a flock of birds that are all your same species. Um, here is a better look at that toucan barbet. So notice the changes from this sketch here. First view of Toucan Barbet. I did see that it has red and yellow on its belly. Um, and it had a fairly large beak, but look how much larger this one's beak is. That's really what it was like. 
And look at how much brighter the red is. Like I had it like, oh, there's some red on the tummy. And so I just had a kind of little mark here saying, you know, this is, this is red. Um, but I just didn't have the courage to, <laughs> to do something like that yet. Um, and that was really, really fun. Um, in a couple of weeks or maybe next week or coming up soon, I'm going to do some classes on drawing hummingbirds. Came up with some sketches, uh, some ideas on, on drawing those, which I'll be sharing with you then. Um, <clears throat> but something that I found worked really well that I hadn't done before is this, these little highlight feathers in here. They kind of make it look a little bit shimmery. Um, that's gouache on top of dried watercolor. And so coming in with some bright flecks of gouache um, was a great way of making my hummingbirds just a little bit more shimmery. So I'll be sharing that kind of whole approach with you folks coming up soon. So we'll have a workshop on drawing hummingbirds and, and, irid, uh, and iridescence. Um, <clears throat> Um, can we all just appreciate how cool toucans are? <laughs> I mean, you're, I mean, I'm, I'm used to seeing these on Fruit Loops boxes, um, but to actually have it come to a feeder a few meters away from me um, was a totally different story that I was completely unprepared for. Um, and then they'll just, they'll hang out and kind of skulk around. They have this very kind of hunchy, hunchy look to them. And um, they'll just sort of sit around, um, and it was raining lately. And they'll 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 pose. So some birds don't pose for you. These ones did. And um, so I'll be, but you know my um, my bird sketching. As you kind of get to this page, you see that I'm kind of getting some of these these light loose sketches they're coming out and they're coming out more sort of regularly looking like those birds. Um, part of that is just having had time drawing, 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 drawing. Anytime you draw on a regular basis, you are going to get better in that period of kind of intense draw time. Um, this is cool. Here's this a snag. Here's where the toucan lived, this hole in it. So here's, here's me, hi, there's a toucan, there's its home. Um, you know, it was, the critters were so cooperative. So here's, I, I also made a bunch of little sketches of kind of just the relationship of these birds because I couldn't get, um, and, and sort of where they were relative to me. So here's me with my spotting scope, sitting in a chair, and I'm not having to look through the telescope because the toucan is right there. Me, toucan, me, toucan. That's so much fun. Um, eating some, uh, some, uh, some, some uh, banana on a log. Behind me, Carolyn has a little cup of sugar water in her hand and she's feeding hummingbirds that are coming to her. Um, there's a real radiation of butterflies in the cloud forest there. And that is, um, those are spectacular. So I got to, I came up with a few uh, new strategies on drawing butterflies that I hadn't come up before, with before, just kind of a quick note on that. So I would first sketch it in with my light pencil, go over that in ink and then put in my bright colors. Notice that I'm doing the same thing with notes saying, uh, that are written on the butterfly itself and around it saying what colors go where. So there's a BK here for black. Don't just put a B for black because blue and black um, both start with the same thing. So put the first and the last letters. And then I would paint the, the, the black in last and the um, and then I would come over that with a darker black and just sort of put in a few swashes in here between their veins that come in on the wing of a butterfly like this. And so I'd hit just a little bit of dark between those and it kind of makes it look like it has veins on it. 
So that was kind of a little innovation, kind of a quick sketching innovation. So you see I'm seeing, doing the same thing here. You see how just having some little dark spots out here where you're not drawing the vein, you're drawing the space between the veins and putting some darkness in there. And you kind of get some of the texture of that, uh, that, that wing. Um, here's little Carolyn, completely covered with butterflies. If you smear banana on your hands, the butterflies land on you. And how much fun is that? So she was just beside herself. Um, and um, more little hummingbirds trying to figure out the males and the females. Um, at the start, notice how, just jump back here. Notice how back here in these upside down ones, everybody is a profile. Everybody is in side view. Well, um, when you're sort of overwhelmed by biodiversity and you're just trying to initially kind of get your bearings, you know, side view sketches, it's, you're going to sort of simplify the number of things that you're thinking about. And to, so putting in a side view sketch is a great kind of quick thing to do. Um, but the more that you kind of hang out with the birds, the more that you get kind of comfortable with them, then you can start to rotate them around. And so you'll see as, the, as they get more comfortable with Ecuadorian birds, you're getting more and more sketches that are at three quarter views and other kind of more interesting positions. Here, you can see some of the kind of progression of drawing hummingbirds and other sorts of critters, starting with a, just a pale ghost sketch, giving myself then some uh, kind of critical ink lines, essentially a little coloring book. Sometimes I might go further and add more texture in with my pen and then put watercolor in over the top of that. Um, I don't always get all the way to this, um, this stage here, but um, you know, so that, you know, anywhere along the, that, that line that you choose to stop is, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get good things. This was a, this is a spectacular bird, the Andean cock of the rock that has a huge kind of pompadour, kind of Elvis mohawk that sticks up on top of its head, mostly obscuring its beak. Um, big white spots on its wings and then dark wings and tail. Um, these are birds that, where the males get together every morning and have a party called a lek, where they display to each other and to females that might be interested. And so they will reliably show up in groups at these leks. And so I'm off in the trees observing these, and um, they're, just, they're just having a great time interacting with each other. Um, apparently, there's a lek site where the birds get even closer than they did. Here, I really had to use my spotting scope to get these sketches, but um, I just found out about another site close to where I was where the birds are, or you can put your binoculars down and just sketch them again. Um, another interesting bird that is uh, in Ecuador is what's called a pitta, a pitta. Um, the ant pittas are these um, very strange looking little critters, um, a small body, super short tail, and ridiculously long legs. They're very, very secretive. But there's a place near where I was in Ecuador where some local farmers um, have gone out for years now, and they whistle in a particular way and put some mealworms on a log and trained the ant pittas that they're their friends. And then the ant pittas, these super secretive birds, come running out of the forest and kind of bob around and um, hang out in front of the, um, out in front of you. And you have a chance just to, um, to, to, to go nuts on the pittas. This is some sketches back um, at the blind. And what I'm gonna be doing in a moment is taking a couple of these drawings and developing them live to sort of from memory and from the notes that I took on the surfaces of these birds. 
And as I do that, I want to demonstrate a few kind of changes that I've made in my approach to drawing birds um, that I think are some really useful refinements. So we'll be returning to this and we're going to be filling in a couple of these birds that were at the um, black light blind. They're rather dull colored birds for Ecuadorian standards, um, but um, they were really cool because they were, they were my early risers. <clears throat> Um, here is, uh, here's the Mot Mot. It also trims its tail to have this little, um, dooley bopper on the end of it. And as it sits there on a branch, it rocks its tail back and forth like a grandfather clock. It goes tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. It's really a <laughs> neat beastie. Um, this is the, um, I'm, probably this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to be filling out these sketches of hummingbirds from the notes that I, I, I took on them. This is a particularly kind of wonderful experience in the lodge where I was staying. Um, a hummingbird got into the building and um, wasn't discovered until Amelia found it and probably had been in there for a day, maybe two. And if you know about hummingbirds, they have a really high metabolism and they need to constantly eat. Um, so this hummingbird was hypoglycemic and absolutely at death's door. It could, its eyes were closed, its feathers were fluffed up. It could not lift its head. It couldn't really move on its own. Um, we tried putting it on a bird feeder. Amelia found it and tried putting it on a bird feeder and it just flopped over backwards, hanging by one foot. Um, so she got a little cap full of sugar water and put its beak in it and sat there for about a half an hour. And eventually it's little birdie tongue started to come out and go, you could see the tongue then coming out into the sugar water and then more and more and more and more. And then it opened its eye, started to sleep down its feathers, kept drinking, kept drinking, slid down its feathers even more. And eventually flew up out of her little hand. And uh, um, it completely changed her relationship towards hummingbirds. Um, so you see, there's, there's just there's a ton of stuff that is going on out there. So here's here, by the way, here's a few more hummingbirds, and these are using I'm using some of the that gouache technique that I mentioned earlier that I'll be sort of sharing with people in an upcoming workshop. Um, just to make things look really kind of sparkly. Here is a page of pittas. So four different um, pittas at the pitta party here. Um, eggs with legs. Um, just wonderful biodiversity. Um, this is a collection of tanagers that I was sketching with the girls. And what we did is we started coming up with our own names for it. So I didn't want the girls to have to think that they needed to find the name of the bird in here. So we just came up with our own names for all these birds. So this is fishy and lightning and bean and spotty. Um, and the, uh, it is, it's amazing. So all these would be coming in in these little mixed flocks and you can just sit there maybe a couple of meters away and um, they're performing for you snacking on banana. Um, last thing I'm gonna leave you with is just a few sketches of the adventure girls. There's Amelia and Carolyn um, ready for action. They told me about, um, th this is a combination of the stuff that they had and the next time that they go, the stuff that they want to have with them. So um, <laughs> I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful experience um, and can't wait to go back there with um, some of you folks. Um, let's take a look at some strategies then uh, of once I, I have my, my bird framework down on my piece of paper, what am I going to do from there? Um, just uh, for, for, for people who um, haven't seen this before, the, the approach that I used to kind of get that initial framework was 
I would look along the back of the bird and draw in the, the, the sort of the silhouette of the back of its head and the angle of its back. That was my line number one. I then put in a ball of the, for its head and a little line to show what, which direction it was looking. And then looked at what was the angle in on the throat and the upper belly of the bird. So those were the essential lines that I had to get right at the start. So when that um, uh, um, for the uh, to kind of get the, the the sense of the bird, then I put in a little egg for its body, and I now I'm putting in a, also a little ball, um, often at its sort of booty, its the its upper tail feathers and its under tail feathers. So that's something that I'm kind of often doing now, not always, but often. So so it helps me kind of. Uh, or if you know if you have more of an egg shape with this, maybe you don't need that. But sometimes I need just a little extra little um, bustle at the tail. Um, my approach for drawing wings used to be that I would draw in the leading edge of the wing, whether it was drooping down or tucked up here. Um, now what I'm finding myself often doing is just putting in a little ball for where the mass of the wing is. So I'm kind of just lightly, loosely kind of going like this. And then off of that, whether the wing is drooping down or drooping or kind of tucked up, um, but I'm finding it really helpful to kind of just have a little ball where that, that wing sits. Another thing I'm doing now that I didn't do before is just making sure that I have room between the upper part of the wing here. So there's enough room for the bird's back because a lot of birds have cool patterns here in their upper back. And um, sometimes if I put my wing too high, I cramp that zone out and I don't have room to really show that. So I'm now just making sure that I've got, you know, birdie's got back. Um, and the uh, I, and I'm making room for those those the, the 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 mantle here in this part of the bird. So that's and then what I'll do is um, if if there's a little zone where I see color, I'll put I'll kind of outline that and then I'll put in a code a two letter code. Um, for black I put B K for blue I put B um, E. So not the first two letters, but the first and the last letter. Because if you do the first letter, then green and gray come up the same way and blue and black come up the same way. And who wants that, right? Um, so um, with white and um, uh, I sometimes we'll put just a W in because there's only one of those, but red um, is often an RD and rust, an RT, um, you know, pink, a PK, um, yellow, I'm often just putting in a Y. So I've, I, I will put little notes that this is BK, um, that the RI is, you know, red. And, um, or I can also write those notes just right on it. So if this part here, I just want to make sure that later on when I'm looking at that, I will kind of know the boundaries of those zones. So if this is yellow from here to here, I'll just give myself a little line and say that that's white. So while the bird is there in front of me, I will be doing these sorts of things. Another thing that I found that I really needed to do was to pay closer attention to the diversity of beak shapes. Um, if I'm not familiar with these birds, you know, I, at first I thought, you know, they've all the tanagers had beak shapes that were the same. And then I discovered that they weren't. Um, some had more petite beaks, others had bigger beaks. Um, so I will often now put in, in this drawing, off that, here's my little circle for the head of the line. Um, I will put in a little triangle over that to help me get, you know, is it, does it have proportions like this? 
does it have more proportions like this? So I'll put a little triangle over that line just to help me get those proportions of the beaks. Especially important if I'm looking at groups that I'm not familiar with. Otherwise, I tend to go for a more generic look for those birds. A great example of that is my first barbet. Um, that's a pretty big bill, right? Because I thought to myself, oh, it's got a big bill. But it's not nearly as big as that, right? Which is closer to what the barbet had. It was sporting quite a beak. All right, let's fill in a little bit of line work on some of these birdie friends here. And I'm going to be doing this with a ballpoint pen. There it is. All right, this is a Bic Atlantis ballpoint pen. Um, it is a... Um, it, it does a pretty good job of not being really blotchy. Um, it's convenient because it's got a little click back and, and I like it. So if you look here at this drawing, I'm gonna be looking at this one here. You can see, um, you can see a few places where I'm kind of lightly blocking things in you can also see places where I've kind of come around and just sort of punched in a little bit more of a line to kind of get myself to notice something that that was important, that I had, I wanted, you know, more angles around the forehead. I wanted this thin little beak shape. So those are punched in a little bit more. Um, my original beak shape on this one was very generic, and then I refined that. Um, so this also does allow me to, um, um, sort of to, to modify my, my, my sketches as I'm going along. Um, this one had, there's a little bit of, um, uh, this says o, um, O-E here on the throat, that's for orange. This is brown, B-N, but notice that I've got little circles all through here. This had all these spots across its chest. I've also just indicated that there's a light pale area around its eye and coming back here a little bit. Thin little beak. Something that I used to do is I used to say, once you've got this in, just sort of start anywhere, start with the wing, all of these sorts of things. Now I am always starting at the beak and then making my way from the beak to the eye. Um, if I can get that part of the bird to look back at me and um, uh, um, then the bird is going to be much more successful. In addition to that, um, getting the distance between the beak and the eye, once I get my beak, then I then can really intentionally place my eye. Um, I kind of go back to some earlier birds, if there's any in here. Um, yeah, I, I, like here's this little hummingbird. Um, I'm not being too careful with the distance between the beak and the eye here. And this bird's eye is much too much in the center of its head. And so it um, looks cute, but it's just is wrong. <laughs> um, so now what I do is I'm going to start with the upper bill here. Oh, I'm going to get my pencil, my pen to start again. And so there is my upper beak and my lower beak. This one, I think, has a little bit of a curve to it. At least that's what I thought I was seeing when I was out there. Um, I'm not going to draw a line all the way coming down the mouth here. I'm just going to sort of lightly kind of hint that in here in this part of the beak. A little bit of a hook in the front here and a little bit of a hook in the back of it. And now I'm going to place my eye. I want, I want room here in what's called the lores. L-O-R-E-S is this space between, um, between the eye and the beak. 
And sometimes a lot of birds have a little bit of a kind of an angry birds mark there as the lures come in. And that, um, that makes this eye um, makes this eye um, a kind of uh, look, look a little bit more serious. Um, I'm going to suggest that this is a dark eye, but leave a little highlight on it. And a little hint of an eye ring. And this bird also had kind of coming off the back of that a little hint of a sort of pale spot. So I'm just going to kind of indicate for myself that I want to leave a little bit of pale around my eye there. My forehead is going to come up and over. When I get to the back corner of the head here, I'm going to just kind of give a few little Bill Berry marks right in there to kind of make this look like it's a little bit fluffy around the top of the head. Its ear patch comes under the eye and down and around. So that's just sort of no real kind of changes in the shape of the ear patch. And then the back of its head is going to come like this. From this point here, I want to imagine a line going all the way across to there. So I can then put my throat in. Throat starts not on the bottom corner of the beak, but up the beak just a little bit. And there's my throat. And now, <clears throat> I'm going to just lightly indicate that this bird's head is darker up here. And with these strokes, I'm following the direction that the feathers actually go on the head. So if these lines show up in my um, sketch later on, after I put some color on it, it'll just sort of feel like a little bit of feather texture. Then Birdie got back. And the top edge of the wing, I'm going to turn my book like this so that I can get a better angle with my hand. Um, the top edge has sort of a pad of feathers on all birds called the scapular feathers that kind of tuck into this area here. They cover up the top edge of the wing. So that's back. in the scapular feathers there. Now for my wing here, I'm not going to put too much detail in it, but I do want to suggest what I see. I've got a hint here. Oh, by the way, with these wings, let's go back to this for just a second. Remember I talked about how I'm kind of putting in that ball for the wings. Something that I am really still, I'm now paying much more attention to is on the wings, there's going to be this big pile of secondary feathers that will kind of get more squared off and blocky towards the back end. And on different birds, the primary feathers stick out to different degrees. So on some birds, the primary feathers are like really long, like that. And on some, they're really short. And on some, they are almost non-existent. So there are some birds that I was drawing in the forest here that uh, had no primaries. So for instance, this little bird here, if you look here in the notes, it says here, no PI, it's rusty, no PI, no primaries on this little bird there. So on this bird, I've got an indication of some fairly short primary feathers sticking out there. And I'm going to get just a hint of some covert feathers in here. Um, in other classes, I kind of go into detail about the wing structure. But for here, I'm just going to leave it just like this. I've got a, a zone in here of covert feathers, a zone in here of secondary feathers, short little primaries. I'm going to give my little birdie a short tail. And now I'm going to put the belly of the bird on. And as I do this, um, as I do this, I'm going to go. I'm going to put in a new, a new thought that I have 
um, about these, these, these birds. What I used to do, and I'll do that on here to show you what, how I used to draw it. I would draw my belly coming around here. And then I would say, and here are my, kind of the end of my, 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 my flank feathers and my undertail coverts tuck um, in underneath like that. But after watching a bunch of birds in Ecuador, I've changed this area in my sketches just a little bit. So let me show you how I am now handling that. Um, so the belly is gonna come down like this, but what I'm seeing is that on lots of birds, um, those belly feathers, um, I'm gonna actually stop them a little bit short of where I used to and kind of suggest that this is sort of a feathery edge. And then on the underside, you see it get a little bit of the bottom of the bird and then the undertail coverts like that. So I'm actually seeing on the other side of this little curve of belly feathers, there's a little zone right in here that um, seems to be another feather group. So I need, I'm kind of wanting to look at that area a little bit more. So rather than just this coming up here and that sticking into it, what I'm now getting is the sort of the sense that I have the curve on the bottom of the bird and then I've got a little bit more of the belly of the bird and then those undertail coverts there. So there's a little bit of an angle that I'm noticing right in here. Stuff that is not just undertail coverts, but more of the sort of the body of the bird. I need to figure out what is the name of those feathers right in there. And I bet looking in David Sibley's book, he's gonna have the answer for me. Um, from that junction where this little curve comes in, that's often where I'm seeing the legs coming out. So this is a little bird that was hopping around um, early in the morning, picking bugs off of, oh, oh, the, 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 be the belly, the belly. All right, so the orange throat, and then it has it had all of these, these little, these little spots on its tummy. And the spots, curved around and it got a little bit smaller towards the back and I know this because of that that's what I'm sort of showing in my little sketches my sketches may be wrong but that's what I have and I'm going to make these little marks as they get towards the belly in this direction skinnier because spots in that area would be foreshortened And so all that information was captured by my, those little blue pencil notes so that later on I can kind of fill this bird out. There will be mistakes in this and that's okay. But this is based on those notes, how I think that that bird looked. I'm gonna drop a little bit of color onto it. And then um, see if we can find that bird in a bird book. It was fun to just kind of take a look at how those, that, that, um, That bird drawing technique has 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 morphed, right? Color test. It's too dark brown. I want it more red brown. Color test. That's better. So I'm going to come up here. And then maybe add a little bit more red brown into that color test. A 
the eye spot area was not really bold. So I am going to just take, I'm going to kick that back a little bit. So it still pops out a little bit. Let me give my birdie a little bit of orangey on the throat. And then that on the spotty chest kind of turned to brown. I'm going to get rid of a little bit of paint on my brush so that it's not as dark as the back. There we go. With the tip of my brush, I can make that fairly sharp, which allows me to get into some of those nooks and crannies. Bird kind of had a wren-like feel to it, but it wasn't it wasn't full in your face, Ren. There it is. Once it's totally dry, I can also uh, check out this fun to do uh, a little touch. It makes a big difference. Um, actually, to help this dry, um, I'm going to hit it with my hair dryer here. Um, all right. So here, I have the stub of a white Prismacolor pencil. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, on the back here, I'm going to, let's, let's come down closer on that so you can see. I'm going to give this just a little bit more texture to make these, these feel like kind of these sort of hard zones. But watch if I just put a little bit of white pencil texture in here, this will start to feel fluffy. Um, if it's too in my face, I can give it a little bit of a rub that pushes it back a little bit. Just a little kind of hint in here and say, hey, look, we're fluffy. What if this part here gets a little bit more fluffy? Here, I'm going to put in some a few little lines be right where the edges of some of the covert feathers would be. And the secondary feathers get a little bit of a hint in there. So a little bit of these little fluff marks goes a long way. This feels pretty solid orange. So what if here in the throat, it just got a little bit there. That's nice. Highlight there, highlight in the foot. So that, that just sort of makes the bird feel a little bit more, yeah, more fuzzy. 
And this was seen, uh, it was very dark. You were in the understory, um, the sun has just come up. So this bird is picking stuff off of the canopy so I can put in some real dark next to it here. Bring that right up against the little voice balloon to help further connect it with that voice balloon. And maybe I'll put just a little hint of some brighter moss or something down in here. Now, um, this edge is a little bit lost against the dark, so I'm gonna strengthen it right in there. And there's my little birdie friend. I'm going to now sort of sit down with my field guide and see if I can figure out who this is. But I was able to kind of collect a lot of good, useful information about its plumage when I was out there. And uh, over here, you'll see just a few little kind of posture sketches of that same bird. Another little posture sketch. So it was very Rennie with that little short tail, little head. Sweet. So um, changes, changes to my general strategy. Uh, this now kind of beak to eye connection, I think is really important. Um, and uh, sometimes that and kind of helping it kind of a little bit of dark in there helps to um, connect that beak and that eye. Um, this little area in here, this is where the flanks come in, I've moved my sort of visual model of what the basic bird is like, that has moved forward, whereas used to have that back. So you see, as I, I study bird anatomy, but it doesn't mean that I've got it right. I just have my kind of best kind of gestalt sense of what the bird is like. The more I observe birds, the more accurate my kind of mental model of bird, of, of birds um, um, pops out. I was looking at a video online of David Sibley sketching things. And it was just, you know, the lines that he's making are the result of just hours and hours of spent drawing and sketching and observing and sketching and observing and sketching and observing and sketching. And I'm sure he's also kind of modifying that over time as well. Um, but you know, here in the short uh, time of that trip, I've sort of made a number of refinements of kind of how I'm going about sketching things. And uh, there's one of my, say hello to my little friend. Let me see, let's jump over to just kind of a, um, other sketches in here. You know, that's, that's kind of the, what's going on with, with my new approach to appreciating lovely birds. And who knew that a quadamundi could take its nose tip and curl it up? I didn't. Look at that. It's like snuffleupagus. It was so cool. Um, I had so much fun. And so I want to go there with you. Um, 
you know, we've got to, as, 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 as a world, as a community, um, let's do what we can to beat down this COVID thing. Um, things that make a big difference is the more of us that um, get vaccinated, um, we really reduce the uh, ability of this beastie to jump from one person to another. Because getting vaccinated doesn't mean you won't get COVID. It does mean you won't die, which, which is really, really good. And it also means you're going to be a lot less infectious to other people. So I want to go there with you. Um, and uh, we can do that if, you know, we as, as a large, um, you know, the, the uh, vaccine acceptance in Ecuador is really high. Um, and uh, we could, we could, we could, we could learn um, a lot from that. Um, and I, so I hope that this, these strategies have been helpful to you. There maybe there's a, a few new things in there. It's also, it's kind of interesting um, uh, to, uh, it's always interesting to take a look through other people's journals and see the sorts of things that they notice, the way that they're doing things. Um, you know, for me, for instance, I discovered that drawing my kids, my journal, um, I loved doing it. It was really, really fun, and it also kind of connected them a lot more with with this 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 the journaling process, and inspired them. They loved seeing themselves with butterflies <laughs> on the pages of my journal. It's like that's me, isn't it, Dad? Like, yeah, that's you, Caroline. Um, so um, thank you all for being here. And uh, what we can do now is we're going to open this up for just uh, some some discussion. Uh, any thoughts or ideas? Um, uh, initially kind of relating to what we're, we're uh, what we discussed here, and then we'll also open it up to just sort of a general journal share, um, give people an opportunity to show pages from what they're doing and let us know how you're doing, what you're thinking about, um, and uh, for an opportunity for us to connect. Um, oh, guess what? Today, just, just one other thing, um, today at one o'clock, I get my booster. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that. Um, so I'm now eligible for that. So yay, science. Thank you, science. <laughs> I feel, uh, feel really grateful for that whole sort of scientific endeavor. Um, so uh, of the way, what we can do is I'm going to jump over to the gallery. If there's something, if you've got a comment or a thought or an idea that you wanted to share, um, let's start by jumping over to Walters. Um, and um, you're not in Latvia night right now, if I am correct. Um, I'm going to add you in. And uh, uh, so uh, whereabout on the planet are, are, you, uh, are you sitting right now? How are things going? How's the wind surfing? And how's your journal? Mm, I'm in the Canary Islands. That's... Uh... So that's uh, just a right uh, Morocco. That's just right uh, west of Morocco. So uh, uh, I'm pretty down south to, uh, from Latvia. So, uh, but I had a question. I saw that in your journal, uh, you used three different, so I counted three different kinds of things. So first, firstly, you put with the pur purple pencil down, then you go with the ballpoint pen, and then sometimes with the zebra pen. So, so how do you decide at how do you decide at what moments will you go with the zebra pen? Because I find it overwhelming to kind of to have three tools in my hand and then just take one and take one. So lately I've been just using the ballpoint and but it kind of it it doesn't look very good after you finish the sketch. The ballpoint is kind of there. The balls all. Uh, like from the couple of tries, it looks kind of messed messed up a bit. So, how do you? Um, I I I'm absolutely with you on that. I cannot. There's there's we we so we've talked before about kind of the idea of cognitive load, that our brain's capacity to like handle information and a bunch of stuff at the other at one time is very very slim. Um, it turns out that human beings cannot multitask. We can task switch, and some people kind of will task switch quickly, but there's actually a huge 
um, uh, energy bump that it takes to task switch and the um, and also what people have found is that when we are task switching, there is a place where our brain, because of the work of task switching, our brain is kind of going and is kind of idling for a minute. So the more you can avoid, so you kind of help your brain by kind of just get little nuggets of things and try to avoid as much task switching as possible. So I will start with that purple pencil or the non-photo blue pencil. Then I go in with my ballpoint pen. And then sometimes what I will do at the end is I will come back in, um, like you, you see some sort of thick lines in there that's obviously like the zebra pen, right? Um, so those, um, let's go back to our little, to my little friend. There it is. Um, so what I will often do at the end is once I'm done with that, is just kind of come back in and I am going to add just a little bit of line variation and pop in a few places. So I'm just very kind of very, whoops, let's just get down on that. Um, so, I don't want to do it over the entire thing because then I don't have line variation anymore. But just a little bit goes a long way. So I can put my tip down and just flick it up and I get a little line that goes darker to light. And then I have to stop myself before I overdo it with my zebra pen, right? But that gives me much better line variation on that ink line. But I'm, I'm with you, so I will, I will do my primary drawing with the ballpoint, and then I'll come back with that zebra and just peek, peek. Maybe it'll be easier to show that on uh, let's let me just kind of put some zebra on this one that this one's all ballpoint here but if you see that i if i kind of just get you know a few places where my line then is a little bit thicker i mean that's visually whoops where are we there we are that's visually a lot more interesting than if I um, if if I just have that ballpoint pen line. So what I'm but I'm what I'm doing is that is kind of a an afterthought after this. I know Mark Simmons, whose work I'm really inspired by, he'll just sit down with this thing and just kind of go. Doo -doo 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 um but um I, I i i tend to tend to want to um first put go with my ballpoint pen and does, did that answer the question You're currently muted. You're currently muted. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, kind of afterwards, I tried at one moment, uh, like I did where I put down the first with the ballpoint pen, and then I was going like kind of with the zebra pen, yeah. but that didn't turn out very well. So um, right now I'm doing only the ballpoint pen. Uh, or, or you might try just the, the, the zebra pen, um, but the zebra pen in more moderation, because yeah. then you get those really fine lines of the, could we see those stripes again? Sure thing. Uh, um... 
Ooh, I love those different head angles, how it's kind of looking towards you, head turned a little bit, three quarter view on the head, more full front on the, the, the body with a little bit of an angle. Those are really, really fun. Also nice um, abstraction or, or simplification of the, the major kind of feather groups over there on your uh, left-hand page. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you've I've been, got, uh... you're, you're getting a really solid and three-dimensional understanding of the bird plumage and anatomy. That's really cool to see. Yeah, yeah my, uh, my dad also mentioned to me that he's seeing more kind of three-quarter views because I haven't noticed it that much, but uh, a person that uh, that uh, different uh, different from a different uh, view says it. So I one more page. I it's here's kind of almost no drawings, but a lot of thinking going on. And uh, I was uh, doing some spear fishing here, and I saw a stingray. But it was very interesting because from the usual stingray that I see, it had a very, very short tail. So I was wondering if they maybe drop their tails and grow new ones or they can break somehow. But it turns out that was a species, a different species that has like the very, very short tail. So uh, oh, this was nice. a very interesting observation. This, I saw it underwater. So when I came back, I drew it from memory, so. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, and so, I also uh, like the way um, that you're mind mapping all of those ideas. Um, you, you can see that this thought leads to this thought, leads to a question, leads to this thought, leads to a question. Um, and mapping and tracing those ideas with those lines between them really helps you kind of follow those chain of thoughts in a way that is different than if you're in a paragraph and is different than if you just have notes randomly placed. Mm -hmm. I, I had a blast with some uh, mind mapping um, yesterday. I kind of did uh, so four different observations. I found this Bertold's pipit uh, kind of going through these uh, daisies, which are endemic here. Both of these species are endemic, so very, very cool. cool. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of started to think how these two interact between each other. Then a shrike flew up, uh, two shrikes actually. I love shrikes. Also subspecies, which is, which is cool for me. Uh, and uh, uh, then I started thinking how these three connect. Then I found a beetle. It was dead already, but I drew actual size. And uh, I was thinking how all of these connect because the uh, pipit was um, forging on the ground. So I was thinking it must be eating insects, but I haven't mm -hmm. seen like flying insects here at all, only uh, dragonflies and butterflies. So it must eat something small on the ground, but this is obviously too big for it because it, it's, it's a very small pipit. And, uh, but the, this might be suitable for the shrikes and probably these flowers. I was wondering if they attract some of the insects that the pipit could, uh, uh, could eat, some smaller ones maybe. So um, I had a blast with this one. That's really fun. And also everybody notice the, the mind mapping ideas. So you will think better. Also, it's cool to see that enlargement of the one little daisy portion in there. Um, you will think better when you get your thoughts and ideas down on paper, get them out of your head and get them onto paper. And, um, and here you're doing that in a way that is also kind of incorporates visual thinking the mind mapping strategy. So just people can do a, a Google search for the idea of mind mapping and take a look at um, some videos on mind mapping and you'll sort of see some of the strategy that is going on here. You will find um, that some people have very, very tight, rigid techniques of the way that you're supposed to do, be doing mind mapping, the way that I prefer to do it. And what I'm seeing here is more of an open, and more intuitive approach, but some people have a very, very tight 
specific way of they say like do this and then they, so that this is this allows you to kind of trace your ideas. Um, I really like your approach there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that's really cool. Um, let's bounce over to London and see what is happening uh, on Ray Bonto's journal. Hey, uh, good to see you again. Uh, we're going to allow you to unmute in just a moment. We now are just are, uh, unmuting one person at a time um, to keep our meetings safe. Um, oh. Oh, this is cool. This is really cool. Um, yeah, the, 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 the wing is wonderfully abstracted. I really like the way you handle watercolor. Um, and uh, we both got our perylene green in the background. Ah. <laughs> um, it's going to be really fun um, to, to take this little bird. And, and I also like your kind of your, your quick um, sketches up there on the side, just sort of looking at those posture gesture sketches. You know, those, those are really, those really feel solid and they feel like the structure of a bird. So, thank you. And then. Oh. Here, just settle down. Oh, this, this is a, uh, I, I am, I am blown away here. Um, your handling of watercolor is just so, is, 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 you, you have you've you've played with the medium enough to be able to get these kind of glossy effects. I can absolutely feel the texture of the skin and short fur of this animal. Um, this is so exciting. Um, the way the light bounces off the back of this animal, um, and then also going into those. And, and folks, notice that one reason why this feels like, um, yeah, Susan's also loving the way that you can just, you can see the texture of the individual muscles. So you're, you're also seeing those, those individual muscles. I absolutely agree with Susan on that. Um, the, so you can just see the buffness through this. But the reason that this, those, those highlights are working so well is because Ray Bonto has gone really dark in other places. So those lights seem light because the darks are dark. And if you just put your hand over the dark, the, 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 um, the dark part, um, you realize that a lot of that real effectiveness of the sheen goes away. And then you move your hand again. And so I, on, on my screen, I'm kind of just holding my hand up to, to block. And then when I move my hand, I'm like, oh yeah, there's that, that sheen where it just works so well. And also I just love all the different colors that are bouncing around inside that. And tell me the name of the animal again. Celadan. Celadan? Cel yes. Where do you find it? In India. Yeah, in India mostly. So it's a, a large sort of ox that is in, in, in India. This is... This is cool. How heavy are these? Uh, 1.5 tons. And how big? Seven feet at the shoulder and 11 feet long. Wow, gotta respect that beastie. Saladay. That's really cool. That's really, really fun. Um, and, and, and you can, you can feel it too. As, as you do this, you, you know, you can, you can see yourself getting better and better at these, these sketches and drawings. Um, the, so um, folks, if you're wondering, I would like to be able to kind of get to this point, how do I do that? Um, 
So just be aware that Ray Bonto puts in a ton of pencil miles, a ton of brush miles. And don't feel afraid of filling up a sketchbook page with something from, from a photograph, from life. Um, Ray Bonto works from all of those sources. But um, the, if you're worrying about like, oh, I don't want to waste paper. No. Um, if you don't want to waste paper, reduce the amount of junk mail that comes into your house. Bingo. You've just saved so much more paper than you possibly would by, um, you use by, 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 by drawing in your sketchbooks. Um, this is really exciting. I, I just, I, I can, I can run my hand over that animal. I can feel its contours. I have a sense of the, the shortness of the, 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 the hair, the way the light plays on the back of this thing. It's really fun. There's like red, warm reds in there. Um, well, tell us what colors you used um, in uh, those sort of, those, those dark, those, those dark um, shadow areas. Um, black colored pencil and a bit of white. Mm -hmm. And brown. That's really fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, have um, any of your pigeon friends shown up again? Um, not, not lately. Not lately. Um, no. Um, do you want to share your? No, no, nothing to share. Oh, okay. Uh, are are you also a? Uh, oh, Arpan. Oh, this is so exciting. It's great to see uh, you doing this too. Is this done with a, a wash pencil? These ones? Yeah. This uh, watercolor brush. Oh, that's really oh, fun. This paint brush, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Arpan, that's, that's great to see. Um, is it fun doing that together? Yeah. I've wasted a lot of time not being able to be a part of it, but I think I have to go back now. Well, we, uh, we're really happy to, to, to have you back here with us. Um, it's really fun to, to, you know, to, to have some time with you and your family. Thank you. And thank you for sharing those inspiring pages. It's like out of the world, those pages were. Yeah, it's... It's so exciting to see Ray Bronto's uh, progress. Oh, here's so there's a turtle he made out of oh. He wanted to yeah. leatherback, right? Yes, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, that's fun. That is really, really fun. Let, let's see the underside. The other side. That's just that wasn't glazed. Okay, but but it did get a little bit of red, brown, uh, reddish on the underside of the chin, right? Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Yes, yes, right there by the throat. <laughs> that's that's absolute leather back right there. Really great. Thanks. Hey, thank, thank you. you so much. You. It's really good to see you both. Thank good you. Good to see you. Great to see you too. Um. All right, I'm gonna bounce over to the gallery. If there's um, somebody else that has a journal page that you would like to share, all you have to do is turn on your screen and hold it up to the screen and we will, uh, we can come join you there. Um, and not seeing anybody at this point, um, in just a moment, I'm going to be turning off the camera. Um, before I do, I want to remind everybody of the power of yet, um, that if there's something that you would like to be able to do, what we wanna do is just start, we wanna dive into that. And there's a vulnerability in that, it's scary at the start, but the more that you do that, the more that you start doing something again and again, your brain wraps around the activities that you challenge yourself with. And the result is that you build skills at any age in your life. 
Um, neuroplasticity works at all ages. So the signal that your brain needs to, in order to build those, those, those new tracks of neurons with this, it is repetition with effort, right? So um, if something feels easy, then you're actually not doing that activity in a way that inspires brain growth. So you want to push yourself into some mode of productive struggle. And in that place is the sweet spot for our brains to sprout and grow. And um, the skills come as a result of that work. Um, you can absolutely do this. Um, and uh, we're here doing it together. And it's really fun to, um, to, to, to see that that, that happened. Uh, Susan in the, the chat wrote a note that if it's hard, that means you're learning. Um, uh, Joe Bowler, the uh, scientist who studies um, growth mindset and neuroplasticity, um, um, tells her students when they say, you know, like, like this is hard, this is, this is hard. She says, oh, good, 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 good. That's the feeling of your brain growing, right? So when you get into that, 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 that zone where your brain is going, this is hard, that's for, if you have the fixed mindset and it's hard, that means you're doing something that you can't do. So you might as well give up. But if you have a growth mindset, when you get that feeling of this is hard, um, that, um, that's actually you, you're doing is you are you that is you, the feeling you get while your brain is growing. So welcome that and lean into it and regularly put yourself in that brain space. And it your your brain is the best toy that your body's been given, and it's just so much fun to, to kind of get out and to to, to play with, and, um, and and let that happen. Um, the, uh, hey, um, Susan, can I get, um, you, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to join us, um, uh, to, to, to unmute for just a second. I'd love to hear just some, your, just share with some of us, some of your thoughts, um, about, um, uh, about your, sort of the growth mindset and what's happening with your classroom and your students. Well, I, I can't really say it any better than you did, but um, I, I teach math and um, uh, I really enjoy it. And I, I definitely see, I think, I think a lot of people get the impression, it seems to be with art and with math, that you're, you're, you're born good at art or you're born good at math or I'm not born good at art. I'm, I'm, I'm born bad at art. I'm born bad at math. And, and the students that I, that I see do the best are the ones who really do push through that they're they're willing to work hard and push through the um the the that that wall where it feels like you don't know how to do it and and figure out how to do it and once you have that experience then you realize hang on i actually can learn this and it's it's hard and you know honestly some people do learn math you know faster than others and people learn learn art faster than others but it like you say it's it's not about inborn talent it's about um the, you know, putting in the effort, putting yourself in challenging situations. I mean, I guess my job as a teacher when I'm teaching math is to give students a, the right level of challenge. It's not so easy that you're just repeating things you already know, but that it's something that's like a challenge that lets you use the things that you've already learned, but figure out how to make the connection to do a new thing, um, but not so challenging that you can't actually get there. <laughs> You know, so um, yeah, I, I you know that's that's my trained in. So yeah, and 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 once once you see that in one area, and you realize that 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 can be abstracted to all the other areas of skill development. Um, so look for opportunities in as, as I look for opportunities as a parent and as an educator to share that with children. And I also look for opportunities in 
myself to notice where, you know, even Joe Bowler has, there, there are times when these sort of fixed mindset ideas will kind of come up in her brain. It happens to all of us. And so we just have to realize, oh, there's fixed mindset thinking, right? And just kind of go back to, it's, it's not the brain that you're born with. It's the brain you make by your work and your decisions that um, is going to be with you for the rest of your life. Thank you so much for sharing that, Susan. And that's a great way to, so that's going to bring us out. Um, thank you all for being here. And we look forward to being with you all again.